good afternoon. My name is Mohamed Jagana, and it is my honor to present the 2022 Albert M. Sachs Paul A. Freund Award for Teaching Excellence to Professor John Hansen. Each year, this award is presented to one professor for teaching ability, attentiveness to student concerns, and general contributions to student life at HLS. Professor Hansen embodies each of these characteristics and more. After graduating from Yale Law School in 1990, Professor Hansen clerked for Judge Jose A. Cabranes and spent one year as a postdoctoral fellow at Yale Law School before joining the faculty here at Harvard. Professor Hansen's teaching and scholarship meld history, the mind sciences, economics, and law. He has received several teaching awards, has published various pieces, and is a faculty leader for 1L Section 6. Those who've had Professor Hansen in class, as well as those who've not, know how much he cares about his students and their experiences. Students have described Professor Hansen as someone who, quote, teaches students to think critically about everything they need to learn in law school. Someone who, quote, isn't afraid to discuss the profound injustices that are hidden in the rules that are applied throughout our legal systems. Another student noted that Professor Hansen's accessibility and engagement with students outside of the lecture hall is as committed and valuable, valuable as his pedagogy. I say this with no hesitation. Harvard Law School is truly fortunate to have Professor Hansen as a member of its faculty. He has been integral in shaping the last three years for many of us in the class of 2022 who've had the opportunity to know and learn from him. I personally have had the opportunity to get to know Professor Hansen as a student in his corporations class, the Critical Corporate Theory Lab, and as one of his teaching fellows. And I'm extremely thrilled to be introducing him for this well-deserved award. Professor Hansen, on behalf of the class of 2022, thank you for everything that you've done for your students and for the broader law school community. Congratulations. I'm having a little podium issue here, classic professorial issue. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Christina, for making this even more difficult today. Uh, wonderful, wonderful speech. Um, congratulations to class of 2022. Congratulations to you all, everyone here. It's been an amazing few years, and I know that families and loved ones have all been rooting for, cheering for, and supporting the students who we're celebrating today. You should all feel great that we've made it. After my congratulations, I just want to say thank you. The Sachs Freund Teaching Award is truly the greatest honor of my career. The fact that I've received it before does not mean that it was any less shocking <laughs> or any less of an honor to receive it, especially from this amazing class. As someone whose life was transformed by teachers, including my fourth grade teacher, who also happened to be my mom, <laughs> I consider teaching to be a calling. It's my way of giving to the world. It means more to me than you can know that you find it valuable. Like all of the graduates today, though, I'm here primarily because of other people, including so many of you. This morning, I tried to count how many of you graduates I've had the pleasure of working with over the last three years on this side of the podium. From my teaching teams and steering committees to those who helped me design courses or new institutions or tort-themed award shows, I stopped counting at 30. I'm obviously here because of you and my ability to outsource to brilliant law students. I want to thank Dean Manning for, among other things, his tireless commitment to HLS and for his breathtaking leadership, dedication, and optimism in navigating the immense challenges of these last few years. Thanks also to the staff of Harvard Law School and the many people whose daily work may sometimes be less visible to most of us but makes what we do possible. If this sounds like an Academy Award, thank you. It's because it means that much to me. 
sort of my Nobel Prize. I want to thank Carol Igo, who I've had the great pleasure of working with for 30 years, and who has come out of retirement three times in the process so that we can continue <laughs> that streak. So grateful. I want to thank my wonderful family who tolerate me, my parents and children, for their incredible support. Special shout out to my son, Ian, who's with us today, and his girlfriend, Grace. Thank you for coming and for your love and your encouragement and your humor. And Kathleen, thank you for being my best friend. My biggest cheerleader and my rock. Finally, thank you, class of 22, for this honor and for being a truly amazing class. Now, here's the problem. I have felt an unbounded admiration and joy for what this class has done and achieved and what it's doing today. But that has unfortunately been mingling over the last few days with my angst about our world. And it has created in me a very strong urge to say something, which is not a good thing when you're a professor. And so I beg your indulgence. This is my last chance to profess to you. And I've composed some remarks over the last 48 hours that are more sobering and earnest and longer than I had originally intended. I apologize, but please let me continue and please listen as best you can. So law schools generally, and Harvard Law School especially, is famous for training its students to think like lawyers. We do a heck of a job of that. For better and worse, we change how our students think, how they see social problems, and how they understand themselves. Along the way, we teach them how to behave, how to act and perform like lawyers. Implicitly, we even teach them how to speak about the law to different audiences. When speaking about law on momentous public occasions like this, we law people tend to elevate the legal system and profession highlighting our transcendent values and goals, liberty, democracy, and truth. But on top of all of those, we place justice. The law loves justice. By the way, as co-founder of the Systemic Justice Project and the Justice Initiative, I too love justice. And I believe all of you love justice. I've taken polls in different settings and all the hands go up. We love justice. Harvard Law School loves justice. Our mission is to educate leaders who contribute to the advancement of justice. As highlighted on our Instagram page, HLS is dedicated to advancing the cause of justice all over the world, even in Switzerland. <laughs> As exemplified by our mission statement, when speaking of law's broad purpose in public like this, we don't sound like lawyers, we sound like priests pointing to some higher value above ourselves and above the law. But in contrast, when we're working and speaking within the legal system, among ourselves, the discourse turns to law itself, doctrines, precedents, analogies, theories of interpretation, and so on. In those moments, we lawyers operate like players in a kind of game speaking a special language and strategizing within a complex set of rules, procedures, and norms. That's the stuff of lawyerly thinking, and it's the stuff that legal education is designed to primarily impart. It's what Harvard Law School does best. When operating in that lawyer mode, however, talk of justice all but disappears. It takes going to law school to fully appreciate this gap between the law's purported goals in public on the one hand and law's practical commitments on the other. But you don't have to go to law school to recognize the tension. In fact, if you allow me to paint with a very broad brush and take some liberties with historical details, we can find clues of it right here around ourselves today. Peering toward the heavens, you will find colorful banners soaring above us, highlighting our truly lovely new shield and motto, Veritas, Lex et Iustitia. That's truth, law, and justice, but it's in Latin, so you know we're serious. <laughs> 
for all the world to behold, for all our guests to marvel at, we have sandwiched law snugly between two unassailable values, truth and justice. Now return to terra firma with me and we find our feet planted on real estate named after one of our most celebrated and influential graduates, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who among other things served on the US Supreme Court for as long as I've served at Harvard Law School, 30 years. It used to seem like a long time. Even many of you who have not been to law school have probably heard of Justice Holmes because he was a big deal. And his brilliance and influence has been a source of institutional pride. That's why this space that you're sitting on is called Holmes Field. Given our public commitment to justice and Holmes's prominence in the HLS pantheon, you might assume that Holmes loved justice. But a little digging reveals that, at least in non-public spaces, Holmes was not a fan. As he wrote in a letter to a friend, I have said to my brethren many times that I hate justice. These are his words. I know if a man begins to talk about justice for one reason or another, he is shirking thinking in legal terms. In Holmes's view, justice and thinking like a lawyer are simply incompatible. There's a well-known story about an exchange between Holmes and his friend, Judge Learned Hand, another influential HLS graduate. The two had just met for lunch and were returning to their respective chambers as Justice Holmes was setting off in his carriage. Judge Hand called out to him. He said, do justice, sir, do justice. Now, rather than nodding and chuckling and driving on as you, you might have, Holmes pulled his carriage to a stop and called Hand over to reprove him. That is not my job. It is my job to apply the law. In his role as judge, it seems, Holmes saw law and justice as mutually exclusive and justice as completely irrelevant. Today, when the rule of law seems to offer a bulwark against the threats of untethered power and fascism, Holmes's fidelity to his role and the delimiting boundaries of the law seem altogether desirable. Unfortunately, though, it's not that simple. If justice truly is our ultimate end, we must remember two problems with the so-called rule of law and the purely logical way of thinking. First, throughout our history and today, there have been countless laws meticulously applied that have produced profound injustices. American slave laws are but one obvious example. The rule of law begins to lose its appeal as soon as you examine the laws themselves. Holmes the scholar, no longer a judge, before he was a judge, understood this. And was actually critical of mindless loyalty to precedent for its own sake, he wrote, it is revolting to have no better reason for a rule of law than it was laid down in the time of Henry IV. We have to look at the laws themselves and not just the rule. There's a second problem with the rule of law, and that is it's illusory. As these graduates learned or discovered in 1L, there is no rule of law, no ultimate source of determinate legal answers within the law. True, a particular regime of legal rules often generates a collection of predictable outcomes, but those, act, those outcomes are never inevitable or required. With equally plausible legal reasoning, that same regime is capable of producing entirely different outcomes. Indeed, significant variation and trends in legal outcomes are observable over time and jurisdictions, even when the underlying applicable rules are the same. As legal scholars routinely demonstrate, it's often possible to trace how shifting power dynamics, cultural norms, political trends, or external influences help produce those shifts, and how courts will nonetheless rationalize those shifts as if the changes were required by law. Justice Holmes understood that as well. 
Before he joined the bench, when he was just a young scholar, he wrote an amazing and now classic book, The Common Law. I recommend it. Now let me put one more part of this quadrangle into the conversation. Holmes's book was partially a response to Christopher Columbus Langdell, for whom this grand edifice behind me is named. Langdell was the first HLS dean. His influence is still palpable in the lives of law students here and around the US. I'm sorry, law students, about that. But I digress. All you need to know about Langdell for our purposes is that he believed that the law was self-contained. It had an underlying essence or logic that was discoverable through rigorous study of cases, preferably at Harvard Law School. Holmes disagreed with that. In what would become one of the law's most famous aphorisms, Holmes opened his book this way. The life of the law has not been logic. And I'm imagining many of you could just finish this. It has been experience. He argued that legal rules and legal reasoning are not despite appearances, the vital source of law, rather something external to law was driving it, experience, by which he meant the felt necessities of the time, the prevalent moral and political theories, intuitions of public policy, even the prejudices which judges share with their fellow men. So there's Holmes, thinking like a legal scholar, and he argued that legal reasoning had been more confabulation than cause, that there was no underlying spirit of law, no rule of law. Such an understanding suggests that jurists interpreting and implying the law possess some discretion and inevitably must decide among alternative outcomes. Holmes the scholar thus recognized that the law was neither self-contained nor fully determined, and Holmes won that debate. Take that, Langdell. And yet, as I highlighted earlier, Holmes as a judge, practicing, deciding cases, was hostile to the notion of anything other than the law or legal reasoning as being determinate. In that role, Holmes hated justice and wanted to resolve each case solely with regard to the law itself, as if the law were self-contained and possessed a single irrefragable answer to every question, as if Holmes the judge agreed with Langdell. It's puzzling, I would say. Why did Holmes the judge harbor such antipathy towards conclusions that Holmes the scholar so persuasively championed? Here it might be illuminating to say a few words about one of Holmes's most infamous opinions, Buck v. Bell. In 1927, Justice Holmes upheld a state statute permitting compulsory sterilization of the so-called unfit, including the intellectually disabled. That would mean that young Carrie Buck would be sterilized without consent on the purported grounds that she was feeble-minded. It's a tragic story that we don't have time for. More broadly, though, the opinion afforded judicial affirmation and constitutional protection to some of the most egregious US policies and practices associated with the eugenics movement in the early 20th century. Policies that would serve as a model for the racial policies of legal and legal theories of Nazi Germany. To be clear, Justice Holmes reached his conclusion based upon plausible legal arguments, legal reasoning, and legal precedent and analogy. As Holmes tended to do, he had some tweetable phrases in there as well. Nonetheless, beneath the surface of Holmes's reason was discretion. Had he been so inclined as he readily could, he readily could have mustered equally valid legal reasoning to strike that law down. One might say that the lifeblood of the opinion was not logic, but experience, that is, intuitions of public policy that he had based upon felt necessities of the time and judicial prejudices. Although those intuitions and prejudices were only implicit in his opinion, Holmes did later express them in letters to friends about the case. 
Writing to one, he captured his feelings and attitudes this way. I felt I was getting near the first principle of reform. I have no respect for the passion for equality. Years later, he wrote to a friend, Buck v. Bell was the one decision I wrote that gave me pleasure. It seems, in other words, that Holmes' ostensible respect for law did not constrain him from acting upon his own feelings and prejudices. One might also say that behind the veil of legal reasoning, Holmes's, Holmes managed to advance injustice. That example raises some basic questions. Could the law, in practice, hate justice or be indifferent to justice? Might thinking and performing like lawyers and judges allow legal actors to cloak the power and discretion they wield, thus insulating themselves socially, morally, and psychologically from the injustices their decisions produce? If you look, you'll notice that much of the law and the practice of law seems designed as if it were intended to remove the appearance of human agency from its key actors. Law people perform as reactors, not actors. Lawyers serve clients as advisors, agents, representatives, and zealous advocates. They are officers of the legal system owing ethical and professional obligations and operating within strict procedural rules. Judges serve the law. They find the law and apply the law. They are constrained or bound by the law, always doing what the law requires, what statutes dictate, or what the Constitution mandates. To further distance the people from their role, judges wear robes. They sit on high benches, and they speak of themselves as the court. Legal staging, legal costuming, and legal thinking combine to render lawyers and judges but cogs, excusing the humans occupying those roles from any responsibility for their actual choices. Veiled within the system, those actors to easily, nonetheless, determine the distribution of duties, rights, wealth, and power in our society, as well as when and toward whom the coercion and violence of the state is directed. With so much actual power, it is understandable why judges and lawyers might crave the psychic refuge through disconnection and rationalization, especially when legal outcomes conflict with their own moral code or with the community's sense of justice, or both. How comforting it must have been for jurists to claim obedience to law's mandates, for instance, when deciding cases like Dred Scott, Plessy, Korematsu, or Citizens United. But even in more mundane cases, the competing valid claims of litigants and stakeholders no doubt leaves decision makers and actors in the system who bear the heavy burden of making these difficult decisions, yearning for someone or something else to pin the decision on. By professing allegiance to fixed laws, the law made me do it, judges have found psychological sanctuary in the affirming claim of disempowerment. I have no power here. Perhaps that helps explain why Justice Holmes so adamantly declared that it was his job to apply the law and why he hated justice, thus removing himself entirely from the scene of the decision. To contemplate justice would be not only to imply that he had power to decide, but that he might also have a moral responsibility to do justice and in turn might have some moral accountability for the injustices produced by his decisions. Now, who knows if Holmes felt such dissonance. We do know he was at least annoyed by critics of his Buck v. Bell opinion as he complained to a friend shortly after he wrote it. One letter yesterday told me that I was a monster and might expect the judgment of God for my decision. 
Whether there's anything to my speculation about Justice Holmes and legal history is not my specialty. What is clear is that there exists a peculiar chasm between what we law people claim in public about the legal system's goals and what we do in practice. What are we to make of all of this? My point today is not just that law is hypocritical, though I think it is, nor is my purpose to provide a bad man theory of Justice Holmes. I think what we saw in Justice Holmes we can find in all of ourselves. I also have no interest in promoting a more activist judiciary, especially not at the moment. My goal is to highlight fundamental and unexplored tensions and tendencies that seem baked into our system and profession in the hope that recognizing them might shed light on the sorry state of the world today and help prepare this amazing generation of law people who love justice to better meet the challenges ahead. I am sure that none of you came to law school because you hate justice, and I suspect that very few of you would have signed up to join a profession that you understood prioritized a way of thinking and behaving over its consequences and highest values. Now, it's true that we may not always agree on what counts as justice or injustice. But notice that the ambiguity has not stopped us law people from continuing to promote justice in public as our paramount goal. Why are we doing that? Notice also we've made no effort to even explore the question of how we might give meaning to and operationalize our promise of justice. We just don't talk about it. In my opinion, most of us would actually agree on a great deal of what justice requires if only we could dare to look. With Jacob Lipton, I've co-authored a recent article on that topic, if you're interested. Regardless, if we law people don't believe justice has meaning, then don't we, in the name of truth, veritas, have an obligation to renounce it? I suspect that none of you came to law school to surrender your moral agency, and I doubt that you can fully anticipate how it may be further compromised after you graduate. But the same sorts of tensions between law and justice and the double consciousness we saw with Holmes reside in all of us. And whether we do so consciously or not, each of us must sort out our own relationship with justice and with law. Practicing like a lawyer makes it very easy to disconnect from justice. Process is often gradual. When you find yourselves in a position of power and influence within the legal system, as most of you will, and when decisions you make hurt some people, as they inevitably will, you may notice your regard for those people slipping or your attention to those consequences waning. You may not want to look at the consequences. You may notice that you have an increasingly bounded notion of what your job or role should be, or an exaggerated estimation of what someone else or some other institution should do. You may begin to find comfort in fatalism or cynicism, or simply begin to lose hope that change is even possible. Life will already be plenty challenging for you and your loved ones. It's predictable that you will feel both fatigue and futility as you struggle to do good and make your work meaningful in a legal system that has too often facilitated, ignored, and normalized injustice. Over time, you may start to feel that values like justice are childish or vacuous. You may find your love of justice fading. Eventually, you may even discover yourself hating justice every time some young person or old professor invokes it in a long speech. If there's anything you take from my remarks, I hope it's this. 
Remember that the problem may not be you or any one of us. And the problem may not be the goal of justice. The problem may be the legal system itself and our collective role in putting law before justice. Class of 22, you are an extraordinary class living at an extraordinary time. In light of injustices too obvious, too raw, and too ubiquitous for me to name, there has never in my lifetime been a more vital need for a group of justice-loving lawyers to get busy. I urge you to use your incredible talents, training, friendships, networks, and reputational capital that you gained from Harvard Law School to help vindicate this institution's mission of advancing the cause of justice all over the world. Even when daunted by the scope of the injustices, the inertia of the status quo, and the sway of powerful interests, I urge you to resist the seductions of indifference and manufactured disempowerment. In this moment, as you make the transition from layperson to law person, I urge you to be courageous and to never give up on justice, or as Learned Hand might have put it, do justice, class of 22, do justice. Thank you very much.